morning, everybody. Sorry, uh, sorry for all the craziness. The devil obviously doesn't want us to teach on uh, this uh, study tonight in Galatians 5. If I can have everybody stand with me, we're going to go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for the time we can spend here together tonight. I pray that you will bless us as we look through your word. And uh, Lord, we pray you will bind the devil hand and foot from causing confusion. And uh, you said everything should be done decently in order. So Father, uh, I just pray that you will heal this sound equipment and help us to move forward with, uh, with our study tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all for being here tonight. I will try to keep, uh, this will be hard for me because I like to move around. Galatians chapter 5 and verses 18 through 26. So we want to start with uh, Paul speaking about walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. So Galatians 5, we're going to start with verse 18. If you were led by the spirit, you were not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. There's a whole lot just in those verses right there. I want to start with verse 18. This is a choice we have to make. And I've heard so many believers over the years just say, I'm sorry, I can't help it. I can't break free of this. It's an addiction. Uh, one of my favorite times of finding out someone who was delivered was with Pastor Joe. And I just asked him, uh, Pastor Joe didn't know how to read before he got saved. And when he got saved, God gave him the ability to read and God took away his addictions. So I think it's because he was willing to let those things go. Sometimes I think as believers, we're not willing to let them go. The Bible says if we're led of the Spirit, we're the sons of God. If we're led of the flesh, we're under the law. So verse 18, if you were led of the Spirit, you were not under the law. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 6. And you can hear me back there okay? Romans chapter 6, all right. Um, if you'll turn there with me. And starting with verse 14. Now, this is a promise from God, and the Bible says all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So all of God's promises are yes. So sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. Amen? And we talked a little bit about that in our prayer tonight for when we prayed for Brother Ed and, and prayed for Timothy that because we're under grace, God does not expect us to follow the law. Now, I understand where Scripture says, you know, let us be holy as he is holy. But we don't have holiness by ourselves. Our holiness is from the Lord. And so if we go about trying to imitate holiness or graciousness or any of those things, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's not our fruit. So the only way we can operate in that is if we allow the Holy Spirit to move through us and produce his fruit in us, amen? Because our fruit is unto death. His fruit is unto life. So sin will not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but under grace. What shall we say then? Shall we sin 
because we are not under the law but under grace? Well, certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So it just depends on who we obey. If we obey our flesh, then we're going to walk in sin. If we obey the Spirit, then we're going to walk in the Spirit. So in verses 19 through 21, we read those. The Apostle Paul lists the works of the flesh. And boy, is there a bunch of them there. Amen? So let's take a look at what Jesus said in John chapter 6. And actually, you don't need to turn there. John 6, 63 says, The flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that gives life. And the words that I speak to you, Jesus said, they are spirit and they are life. So the only way you can really, truly walk with God is to walk by the spirit, by his word. That's how we walk with him. Remember what Psalm 119, 105 says. Uh, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So when our flesh wants to rebel and go forward, God's word speaks to our heart and says no, and that causes us to be arrested and understand that we're moving in the flesh instead of in the spirit. So let's take a look at that. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. So I have a friend who has, um, I'll just say it's a disease. And his behavior got him that disease. And he's a Christian and now is really truly following the Lord, but he's having to deal with this thing in his flesh. And so we have to understand that if I go out in the street as a believer and break somebody's windshield, they will forgive me if I ask them for forgiveness if they're a believer, but I still have to pay for the windshield. Amen? So we have to understand that whatever we sow, we're going to reap it. And that's God's law. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that will he also reap. He who sows to the flesh will of his flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life or life everlasting. So it depends on where we're planting, what we're planting, who we're planting for. Okay. And then Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 is the freedom chapter. It tells us there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So in Romans chapter 8 and verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Now, that is a strange doctrine for a lot of Christians. We are debtors. We owe the Lord. He paid everything for us. We owe him our life. And I'm really quite shocked that many, many believers that I talk to give no importance at all to what we're doing here tonight, gathering together, learning the Word of God. And I've confronted some and said, so you're telling me that you can't even give God two hours in one week of his attention that he deserves for you to be in fellowship with others and learn the Word of God just two hours a week? If you think about it, we have seven days a week times 12. Okay, we have 96 hours that we can spend, and we can't even give two to God per week when he gave everything for us. I wonder what's going to happen on the day of judgment when God asks us, wait a minute, I gave you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you couldn't even give me two hours to be in my house to learn the word of the Lord? And that's what I'm talking about, sowing to the flesh and sowing to the spirit. And it's, it's amazing to me in these days how, I hate to use the word lazy, but I, how asleep some believers are. Just absolutely asleep. 
they, they believe that God is some kind of a cosmic bellhop where every time they need something, they just pull the chain and say, God, this is what I need. But other than that, they have absolutely no time for him at all. And, and I know none of that is in our notes, but I believe that's what Romans 8, 12 through 14 is talking about. So let's read it. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you will put to death the deeds of the body. You will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And I think you'll remember the parable that Jesus spoke about uh, the servant who was given five talents, and another was given two talents, and another was given one talent. The one who had five talents doubled them, and his report from the Lord was, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And the one who had two gained two other. And God said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And the third servant came, and he said, uh, the Lord asked him about his one talent that God gave him. And he said, Lord, I knew that you were an austere man. You're a hard man. And you reap where you haven't even planted. So therefore, I buried your talent in the ground. And Jesus said, you wicked and slothful servant, why wouldn't you have given that talent to make interest or usury so that I could gain back what I gave you? And then his last words to that servant was, take away that which he has and give it to him who has the other talents and cast this unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I believe really with all my heart, because God says we're called to do good works, we can't just throw it to the side. We're debtors. We owe God. I like the book of Philemon. Anybody here familiar with the book of Philemon? Philemon is, is a book that the Apostle Paul met this uh, man in Scripture, and his name was, uh, oh, let's take a look at it. I forget his name right now. The book of Philemon. So it's one of the smaller books in the scripture. I think it's right after Titus. Yes, it is. So Philemon was a friend and a brother to the Apostle Paul. And it, it, it appears in this scripture that Paul actually led him to the Lord. So he says here, Paul, who is a prisoner of Christ, Jesus, to Timothy, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon our beloved friend and fellow laborer. So Philemon was also a laborer in the Lord. A laborer, you know, someone who does work for the Lord. So he says, To the beloved Aphia Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith, which you have towards the Lord Jesus and towards all the saints that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. We have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. So Paul is encouraging Philemon, and he's actually praising him for all the love that he's shown towards other Christians. But watch what he does in verse 8. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is good or what is fitting. So now he's saying, Philemon, I'm not asking you to do this. I'm telling you to do this. This is a, this is a command, okay? He said, for love's sake, I appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now I'm also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. So, Onesimus was a servant of Philemon. And apparently he either stole something or did something that he had to be thrown in jail. So Onesimus was in jail and the Apostle Paul led him to Christ. So now he's a brother in the Lord. Amen? So he left as a slave and a thief, got thrown in jail, and then Paul led him to Christ. So he says, Therefore, I might be very bold in to command you, in verse 8, what is fitting, for love's sake I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. 
I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. He's talking about a spiritual son. You know, if you've led someone to Christ, they're your spiritual child. You're responsible for discipling them and bringing them up in the Lord. So when you lead someone to the Lord, it's your responsibility to invite them to church, encourage them to grow in Christ, begin your own discipleship program with them. Amen? Paul was the father of many in Corinth, and here he now says he's the spiritual father of Onesimus. So he says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while I'm in prison, who once was unprofitable to you, but now he is profitable to you and me. See, once he was a thief, once he was your slave that ran away, but now he's profitable to you and to me, Paul says. He says, I am sending him back to you, therefore, you are to receive him, that is, my own heart. Paul is saying, I want you to welcome him back just like you would welcome me back if I came to your house. And he says, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel, but without your consent I wanted to do nothing so that your good deed might not be by compulsion, in other words, not by force, as it were, but voluntary. For, for perhaps he departed from you for a while for this purpose, so that you could receive him forever. In other words, you know where God says all things work together for good? Paul is saying, look, he left you. He was unprofitable to you. But maybe there was a purpose in that so that when he came to jail, I could lead him to Christ, and now he's going to be profitable to you forever because he's a brother in the Lord. Now watch what Paul does. He pulls the mafia thing here. He says, For this purpose he departed for a while, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more like a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, and how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. And if he wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand, I will repay, not to mention the fact that you owe me your own self even besides. So, so now Paul's saying, you know what, Philemon? You owe me, and I'm calling in my debt. You owe me. You need to receive Onesimus back. You need to bring him back. In other words, don't be walking in the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. And you can only do that by Jesus. I mean, it is amazing how many believers I've met who've had things stolen from them, and they forgave the person who stole them. They forgave the person and prayed that one of them was a great example in our church, Clark. Clark, who owned the Shell Station over here on Main Street. Brother Clark had a guy walk into his service station and punch him hard right in the jaw, almost broke his jaw. And then he stole all of his money and left. Well, they found the guy later, and Clark actually went to court and begged the judge for mercy. And while that guy was in jail paying for robbery, Clark supported his family monetarily. He helped his wife and children with, I'm not going to say how much, but it was a lot of money until he got out of prison. And then Clark invited him and his whole family to come out to his home for a barbecue that he prepared for him. That's walking in the spirit. That is an amazing testimony, and many of us were here to see that. I know Robert was, Pastor Joe was, others were here. Nancy saw it, Barbara saw it, Sandra saw it. There were many of us that heard that testimony. So that's what he's talking about. Look, you owe me, so I want you to receive him back as a brother. Not as a thief, not as a slave who ran away, but as a brother in Christ. Amen? So that's what we're talking about here in Romans chapter 8, where he says, you are a debtor. And let me put it plainly this way. We owe him. We owe him everything. Okay, so in verses 22 and 23, Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit, we know, is love. But there's many facets of love. So I want to turn back here to the book of Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is love. 
And here's what love looks like. It looks like joy. It looks like peace. It's like a diamond. It has all these different facets to it. Love is joy. Love is peace. Love is patience. Love is kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against there is no law. That's what love looks like. So, you know, in the scripture where it says, the spirit of fear causes us terror, but perfect love casts out fear. When we're full of perfect love, it will throw fear out. Nancy and I were visiting one of our elder uh, people today from the church, and she happened to mention to me a pastor who uh, is very, very sick. And... uh, Apparently, he went to a church back east that encouraged him to uh, take the vaccines. And he already had kidney problems, liver problems, back problems, lung problems, heart problems. And that's the very worst thing anybody can do is to take some unproven shot into their body when they're already having all those physical things. Well, he's been in the hospital ever since. And now this person told us, unfortunately, she doesn't think he's going to Uh, be around much longer. And praise God, I mean, he'll be taken to heaven. Praise God, he knows the Lord. But what do people really do out of fear? And God says, perfect love casts out fear. So we, if we're in fear about something, we need to ask God to fill us full of perfect love, and that fear will be cast out. Perfect love casts out fear. So Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and in John chapter 15 and verse 2, God tells us what we can do on our own, okay? And the Spanish word for that would be nada, okay? (laughs) In German, it would be nichts. In Greek, it would be (laughs) oihi. John 15, 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it will bring forth more fruit. You are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. So abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nada, nothing, zero. So when the enemy comes to us and says, well, you need to be doing more, and starts accusing us and putting guilt trips on us and everything else, the best word to use is, I am walking in the Spirit of God, I'm obedient to the Lord God Almighty, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, I will obey my God and what he tells me to do. Because the enemy throws guilt and shame all over the place. And that's never of the Lord. Conviction is of the Lord. Conviction causes us to repent and do the right thing. Guilt and shame cause us to turn away from God and walk away. And hold our head down like Adam and Eve in the garden. So uh, we want to look at Colossians chapter 3. So you'll have to turn to the right. You were in uh, Galatians, so you'll go Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. The answer to this scripture is no, we do not have this in us. It's in the Holy Spirit. So if we walk in the Spirit, we have this in us. If we walk in the flesh, our flesh does not have this in us. And here it is, verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, in other words, as the purchased people of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Amen? I think this is the whole book of Philemon, where Paul said, you know, your slave ran away, 
And he, who knows if he stole something or whatever he did, but he ran. And he got arrested and he got thrown in prison where Paul was. Paul leads him to Christ. And then he tells, uh, he tells Philemon, you have to accept him like a brother, like you would me. Besides that, you even owe me yourself. And Jesus could say that to us. Jesus could literally say, you owe me everything. And that's in scripture. 1 Corinthians 6 says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore you are to glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which now belong to God. So we belong to him lock, stock, and barrel. Every part of us belongs to Jesus. That's why I don't get really worried about any aches and pains or anything like that, unless the Lord really tells me, go see a doctor. You know why I don't get worried about that? He has my life planned out anyway. My body belongs to him. When God wants to take any one of us home, he has free reign to do so. We belong to him. Amen. He even tells us it is appointed unto men once to die. It's an appointment. We all have an appointment with God. And at the right time and the right appointment, God's going to call us home. And wouldn't we rather be there? Uh, I'm not going to mention this sister's name, but she's from another country. And she told me one time, You're, the American Christians have a weird sense of, about death. And I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, in our country, we rejoice when somebody gets taken to heaven. They've graduated. This is a great cause for celebration. And of course, we're sorry that we're going to miss them, but we're happy for them. You know, like the scripture says, rejoice with those who rejoice. And yes, we get sad. We're going to miss our loved ones and our friends who pass on before us. But we rejoice that they're in heaven. I just got a call today from my neighbor across the street. Didn't know that he worked at Coca-Cola. He was actually my replacement when I left. I didn't know that for all these years. We got to talking about where he worked, and now he's retired. And I found out that he's the one that took over my job when I left Coca-Cola. So we talked, and he was telling me about two of my workmates that passed away. Both of them I witnessed to. One of them died a drunkard. And he never did accept the Lord, as far as I know. I, I pray that he did, but only God knows that. The other one, I invited to church in Avila Beach, and he received Christ as his Savior. And I just found out he died of a brain an aneurysm. So I, you know, I was shocked to hear that he passed away, but I am so thankful that God opened the door for me to talk to him about Jesus. And I believe right now he's in the presence of God with fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, just like Psalm 1611 says. Praise God. Of course we miss our loved ones. Man, when, when my father passed away, uh, after the Greek Orthodox funeral, uh, we all got into a limousine and were headed to the cemetery in another town about seven miles away. And my family was sitting in kind of the back of the limo, so I had to sit next to the priest up near the front of the limousine. And he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. He said, I noticed you were the only one at the funeral who wasn't weeping and falling apart. He said, may I ask you why? And I said, absolutely. I wasn't falling apart because I know where he is. I got to lead him to Jesus a week before he died. I know exactly where my dad is. And I even got a sign from my, uh, my uh, brother-in-law, Bill. When my dad was dying, he lifted up his right hand. And that's what I had told him after I left his room. Don't forget to lift your right hand because God says, I will hold you up with the right hand of my righteousness. So when he comes for you, take his hand and he'll take you into glory. So I said, why should I be sorrowful? Yeah, I'll miss my dad. Of course, I'm only 20, you know, 29 years old. But I am rejoicing that forevermore he will be in heaven rejoicing with God, and I will get to see him as a young man. I rejoice over that. So yes, there is a time to weep, but there's also a time to rejoice. There's also a time to be happy for those who are there. I was telling Nancy today as we were visiting, I said, you know what? If you gave your husband all the money in the world, he would not come back here. He would not come back here. He is at full peace, full joy, 
pleasures forevermore, he would never trade heaven's joy to come back to this earth filled with sorrow. Never do it. So it's okay to weep. It's okay to feel sorrow for a loved one who's passed away. But can we also as Christians rejoice that we know they knew Christ as Lord and Savior? Amen? That is the victory. Hallelujah. You know, I wish I knew my 40 plus cousins in Utah were going to be in eternity with me. I've tried to talk to several of them. They're not open, but I pray someday they will be. I have two siblings that I am not sure that they really truly, well, I know one for sure doesn't because he's in a cult. And the other one, I'm not really sure what they believe. But I know this, I'm praying for their salvation all the time. I'm praying that they'll be there. So walking in the Spirit is allowing God's patience, love, joy, gentleness, peace, faith, invade our lives. Because we don't have it in ourselves. We can't walk through this world without the Holy Spirit. In verse 24, those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh. <laughs> well, that should be the case. But I've met so many people, and Sandra, you, you've met more than I have. Well, you know, I know I should be there, but but there's this game I need to go to, or I'm, well, we made plans to go to the casino, or, well, we do. So in other words, you're not going to sacrifice two hours a week for your Savior, who bled and died for you and was beaten half to death, and then killed the rest of the way on the cross. You can't sacrifice two hours a week for your Savior and Lord? That's craziness. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh. So let's go back to Romans chapter 6. You know, you guys, none of this is in my notes. But this is what the Lord has me saying. And it's not for you that are here. It's for those who may be listening on YouTube later that need to be told the truth. Where, you know, if, if, we, if someone said, I'm taking that guy to court and accusing him of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict us? If they took us to court and said, that guy's a Christian right there, would there be enough evidence to convict us of being a believer? I had three different guys who claimed to be Christians at my work. I worked there for 13 years at Coca-Cola. They never witnessed to me, not even one time. They did listen to my dirty jokes, and they cussed just as much as I did, and some of them even snuck in the back and smoked pot with me and my pot smoking buddy. No one ever witnessed to me that claimed they were a Christian until uh, this, this girl that got saved that I knew. She was the very first one to ever witness to me. She'd only been saved five hours. Then the next one that witnessed to me, he came to work for Coca-Cola, was Ben Ruth. And Ben was the real deal. And that's really the first Christian that actually sat me down and told me, all about Christ and all about the gospel. That was it. I lived from here to across the street from one of the biggest churches in town. Had people walk past my house every single day. Every time the church was open, they would walk past my house holding Bibles. They'd cross the street before they got to my house, and no one ever said a word to me about Jesus Christ. Not one word. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look across the street and say, well, that guy's really lost. That guy's going to go to hell for sure. I mean, look at him. Look at the way he looks. Look at the way he acts. Look at his friends, the way they act. They knew for sure. We're not churchgoers. We're not Christians. Nobody said a word. You know, that's in the Psalms. The psalmist said, I looked on my right hand, and no man cared for me. Refuge failed me, and no man cared for my soul. That should never be us. That should never be us. We should, I heard a wonderful testimony from uh, David's wife, Elizabeth, today. She said she had been going to a, a restaurant here in town and had, and had talked to and prayed for the, the people's children and the owners of that restaurant to get saved. And she just found out the grandchildren and the children are now love the Lord. They go to First Baptist Church. They are... They love the Lord, and now it's just the parents that are left that need to be saved.
praise God, Elizabeth, for praying and asking the Lord for their salvation. Praise God, you know. God is faithful if we'll be faithful. Amen. Romans 6, verses 6 and 7. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we'll also live with him. So knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him, and it has no more dominion over us either. That's why we can boldly tell our relatives, sure, you can go to my funeral, but I'm never going to die. You see my body in the casket, but I'm not going to die. My spirit is going to go directly to be before the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The problem is, how many people actually believe that? You know, I've, I've seen people go to the graveside and weep and howl, and uh, I, I just, it kills me to know that they're in the ground. They're not in the ground. That was their container. That's all that that is. That was just the thing that held them. Their spirit is flying free, if they're a believer, flying free to be with Jesus Christ and destined to get a brand new body that will never be corrupted again when Jesus returns. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. God gives us this instruction. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's a big word. But wait a minute. I have rights. I want to do this. I don't want to have to do that. I especially don't want some preacher telling me what to do. So I'll do what I want to do. That's the American spirit. You know, who are we accountable to? We're accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are accountable to our Savior. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know what holiness is before the Lord? Obedience before the Lord. We have no holiness of ourselves. He is our righteousness, the scripture says. But if we're obedient to him, God looks down and sees Christ's righteousness over us. And then he flat gives us a command. 12.2, Romans 12.2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what does it mean to be transformed? Paul said, I become all things to all men, so that by all means some might be saved. So when I'm in Rome, I try to do the things that the Romans uh, would, would be attracted to. If I'm in Greece, I'm, I'm, you know, when Paul went to Greece, he, he looked at all of their idols and said, I perceive that you people are far too superstitious. And then he saw a gravestone that said to the unknown God. And he said, let me tell you about him. Paul went into the culture and made relationships in order to be able to speak to people. Amen? So I'll just use a couple of examples that I know about in our church. People on the golf course need to be saved. We have people in this church who love to go golfing, and they get to share Christ on the golf course. There are people that like to go to the different lakes, Lopez, Nacimiento, etc. They have boats. They get to share Christ with people who would never darken the door of a church. This next Sunday, we're going to have Biker Sunday. Why do we have that? So we can show off our fancy Harleys? No, not at all. We have that so that people who would never darken the door of a church would come in and hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we do those things. Why do we have barbecues? Why do we have all those things? To make sure that people have an opportunity to hear about the Lord. Amen? Amen. So Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. How do we walk this out? That's the question. We don't. Christ has to walk it out in us. Paul said in Galatians 2.20 that I am crucified with Christ, yet I live, yet not I, but Christ now lives in me. 
and the life that I now live in my flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know how we walk this out? Jesus walks it out through us. If I try to do this on my own, I will fail the first three steps. I will fall down. I cannot do it on my own. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But if we're trying to do it in the flesh, how much is the flesh profit again? John 6.63? Nada. Zero. We can't do anything without the Spirit. So in verse 25, as we're coming to a close here, we're going to uh, finish through verse 26. Verse 25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. How do we do that? Well, I think the best example in the Bible is the Apostle Paul, as far as walking in the Spirit. So let's take a look at Romans chapter 7. We were in Romans 6, so just go into Romans chapter 7. And this is what the Apostle Paul said about walking in the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 25 is described in Romans 7, starting with verse 14. Paul says, now we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. My flesh just wants to have its way. Verse 15, for what I am doing I do not understand. That which I want to do, that I don't practice. But that which I hate, that's what I do. What kind of a statement is that? In plain English, Paul said, the things that I really want to do, I end up not doing them. And the things that I hate doing, that I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. If, if then I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Verse 17. But now it is lo no longer I who does it, but it's the sin that lives in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells there. I want you to really get a hold of that. Because... I think sometimes we're tempted to say, ha, huh, I did so good. And Paul says, no. Whatever you do in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and uh, chapter 10 and verse 31, therefore, brethren, whatsoever you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, do it at all to the glory of God. And then the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 1 31, if any man brags or glories, let him glory in the Lord. So if we're going to brag and say, look what I did, or look what the great thing that I did. No, we didn't do any great thing. God did it through us. And that's called humility. That's called really being honest before the Lord. So in verse 18, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells there. For for me to wish to do good is present with me, but how to perform it, I can't find out how. That's what Paul is saying. I want to do good. But trying to find the way for my flesh to do it, I can't figure out how to do it. And so he says, and the good that I want to do, verse 19, I don't do it. But the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I practice. Wow, what a quandary. That's depressing. So Paul, how are you going to deal with this? He says, so now if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who does it, but it's sin that dwells in me. I find then this law, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. Paul's saying, look, I want to do the right thing, but I've had to understand that sin lives in me. And because sin lives in me, it's always trying to drag me back the other way. Verse 22. I delight in the law of God according to my inward man. In other words, in the spirit I rejoice at the word of God. I love the inward man's law from God. I love that. I want to do that. 
But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my body parts. So Paul is saying, look, I, I want to do what's right. I want to follow the Holy Spirit. But there's this other law inside of me that causes me to do the wrong thing. So who's going to deliver me from this? This is something we all suffer with. Who's going to turn this thing around for me? Here's the answer. Paul admits that he's a wretched man. Oh, what a wretched man that I am. Let's park right there. You say, wait a minute. If the Apostle Paul is a wretched man, what does that make me? The Apostle Paul is one of the holiest people in the Bible. What does that make me? Well, if we were to draw as close to the Lord as the Apostle Paul drew close to the Lord, we would see every speck and sin in our life. He got so, and you can test this yourself, take a ballpoint pen and put a dot on your hand and have a friend or your spouse or whoever stand for me to where Philip is and say, hey, Philip, do you see this? No. Okay, step up a road. Do you see it now? No. Step up another road. Do you see it now? No. Step up here. Nope, still can't see it. He wouldn't be able to see that tiny dot, pencil dot on my hand until he got right there. And that's when he could see it. Paul was that close to the light. That's why he could say, I'm a wretched man, because he saw Christ in the Spirit, and he saw all the sin that was involved in him. And that's true grace when we understand that there is nothing good that dwells in our flesh. It's only Jesus who lives in us that can cause us to do any good. So he, he gives his own answer here. Oh, wretched man that I am, who is going to deliver me from this body of death? Who's going to fix this? I thank God then, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I will serve the law of God. And with my flesh, I will serve the law of sin. And that's what we have to come to an understanding. That's what this chapter is all about as we come to a close here tonight. This is all about giving it to the Lord and saying, I can't do it on my own. I cannot do this on my own. I've had people say to me, how do you, how in the world do you come up with four Bible studies and a sermon every week? How do you do that? Because I've talked to some brothers and they said, oh man, I wish you would have let me know a couple months ago. I need to prepare. And so they asked me, how in the world do you come up with four teachings in a sermon every week? And I tell them I don't. I just ask God, what do you want me to say? And then I keep my ear sharpened and listen and write things down that God puts on my heart and in my imagination. And then when I'm all done, I see what God wants to say. And I just say what God wants to say. That way I'm assured not to get in trouble. Because if you say what God wants to say, God has his way. We don't have our way. Amen? It's not always easy. Because I'm preaching to me too. So I get cut as well. But isn't that a good cut? Isn't that a good conviction? When we get put on the right road instead of the wrong road? So then in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 through 6, the very next chapter after, after Paul says, who's going to deliver me? And he says, well, I thank God Jesus Christ will. So now I've understood that with my mind I'm going to serve him, but my body is still going to try to drag me backwards. And then in chapter 8, he starts out and says, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And in verse 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Why? Because Jesus paid for it. That's why. He paid for it. It's kind of like you go out and you buy a new car and you have to make car payments, but what if somebody paid the car off? You have no more car payments. You still have the car, but no car payments. Why? Because somebody paid for that car. And our car happens to be our own soul. Jesus paid it all. Verse 3, For what the law could not do in that it was weak because of the flesh... God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh 
because of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So in verse 26, Paul puts this in there, and I always wondered why did put why did Paul write this verse down? And I understand why. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 says the scripture did not come in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God were moved by the Holy Ghost, and they put the scriptures down because the Holy Ghost moved on them to do it. So it wasn't Paul that wrote the scripture. It was the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. So why did he put this in here? Because we look at other people and we go, well, at least I'm not as bad as they are. Or we look at someone else and go, oh man, I'd like to be as spiritual as he is. And the Apostle Paul had a lot to say about that. He said, you who compare yourselves among yourselves are not wise. And if you're not wise, what are you? You're foolish. Paul said, don't compare yourselves among yourselves. This is why he wrote that last verse in Galatians chapter 5. Let us not become conceited provoking one another and envying one another. Amen? Hey, it would be so easy to sit out here and look at Tony flawlessly play that keyboard or listen to Pastor Loida or Sarah sing so beautifully and think, oh man, I wish I could do that. No, be happy for him. Be thankful that God has given him that gift. God's given you a different gift. God's given me a different gift. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 7, 7. We just talked about that, but I want you to read it in Scripture so, you, so you'll, you'll know that it's actually a biblical concept. 1 Corinthians 7, 7. Paul says, I wish that, every, that all men were even like me. Paul said, I wish all men were just like me. But everyone has his own gift from God. One after this manner and another after that manner. See, they're all different gifts. They're all different things. If you really consider Christmas time around the tree when people are opening presents, are all the presents the same? Are all the gifts the same or are they different? Well, this one gets that kind of gift. That one's older. It gets a different kind of gift. That one's older yet. That, that one gets a different kind of gift. And it's the same thing in the body of Christ. He gives us gifts according to what he wishes for us to have. That's all found in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. So let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 and we'll close. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And i got to be honest with you, when I did this study, I looked and I thought, wow, that's only eight verses. How are we going to drag that out for an hour? And I just felt like the Lord said, that's not your problem. That's what I'm giving you to say. I'll fill in the blanks. And, and, and truly, if we're listening to him, God will always fill in the blanks. He will always answer our questions. So in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, Paul says this. We do not dare, or we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. They measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. We, we can never compare one with another because God has given us all a different gift. Amen? Um, I like this one brother who, if you met him, you wouldn't think he's very spiritual. God has blessed him with a ton of money. 
And he supports so many missionaries all around the globe. It's unbelievable. He spends 90% of his income for God's kingdom and keeps 10% for himself. And it's like, well, yeah, when you got all that money, you know, 10%'s 30 times more than I have. But it's not about that. God has him, given him a gift of giving. So that's his gift. He didn't preach. He doesn't sing. He doesn't run up and down the street telling people about Jesus. He supports those who do. So there's all kinds of different gifts that God gives. But the main part that I wanted to get out tonight in this chapter, we're either going to walk in the flesh or we're going to walk in the spirit. When that microphone wouldn't work tonight, I wanted to just say, you know what, Robert, just trash these and go buy two brand new ones. But that's not the issue. I think the issue is the enemy trying to attack our sound system. Uh, next time you're at your computer and things just seem to go south and haywire, try laying hands on your computer and rebuking Satan and see how fast things turn around. And if not, you can call David and Elizabeth and they'll... <laughs> no, I, I agree with that. It's absolutely true. Amen. I do it all the time in my office. I get ready to type out one of my messages that God has given me, and my computer starts this tick, 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 and then all these things start popping up, and, I, and after a while it comes to me, it's the enemy. So I just put my hand on the screen and rebuke Satan in Jesus' name. You get out of this office, you get out of this computer, and you go to the pit of Tartarus where you belong, and you stay there until the day of God's judgment. And then everything comes back on, and it's like, oh, it's a miracle. You know? <laughs> it's because the enemy knows how to disturb and cause confusion. Amen? So let's pray. Would you stand with me? We're going to go ahead and close now. It's just straight up 8 o'clock. Father, first of all, I want to thank you for allowing us to go forward. Uh, yes, and it is true, Lord. We need a sound system so that we can record videos and send them out. But at the same time, Lord, that's not the main thing. The main thing is the message that you have for us tonight. So I thank you, Lord, for the message that we should walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the only way we're going to do that, Father, is to admit that there is nothing good that dwells in us except Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Father, I thank you that you do dwell in us, that you help us to do the right thing. Even though our flesh wants to do something outrageous, you help us to do the right thing. So I pray you will bless those who will later listen to this on YouTube, and you'll bless those of us who are here tonight. Bless their families, Lord God. I pray that something that was said tonight rings true in each and everyone's spirit, and that we could take that and run with it, Lord. Thank you for your instruction tonight, and thank you for Paul's example, one of the, I think, one of the top apostles that you had on this earth. He humbled himself and said, what a wretched man am I, but I thank God that through Jesus Christ, the Lord, I have the victory. So Lord, thank you for your presence in our lives. Bless us now as, as we're dismissed in Jesus' holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you, church. You were wounded for our transgression. You were bruised for our iniquity. Punishment that was for our peace was laid on